Good morning, church. My name is Kendrick, and I'm, I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary Church West Hills. And before we get started, I just have a, a quick announcement I want to share with the church family. On Tuesday morning, B.J. Farmer passed away. Uh, she's 97 and a half years old. She had been fighting cancer, and Tuesday morning she went home to be with the Lord. On August 2nd, there will be a graveside memorial, a public graveside memorial at Oakwood Memorial, and it will be at 11 a.m. So there will be a, um, a graveside service for B.J. Farmer Monday, August 2nd at 11 a.m., uh, the family's asking that in lieu of flowers that you would make a donation to the American Cancer Society uh, in her name. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to call me or call the church or email us. But again, uh, there will be a public graveside service on August 2nd at 11 a.m. at Oakwood Memorial. If you guys would go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 12, we're going to continue to look at prayer through the lens of Luke. And if you've been with us, you've been following along with us the last several weeks, uh, we began in the Gospel of Luke and we looked at specifically Jesus' teaching on prayer and then we looked at a couple of Jesus' prayers. And then last week we moved into the book of Acts and we wanted to look at how the early church prayed and when the church came together to pray. And that's what we're going to be looking at these next several weeks. Last week we were in Acts chapter 4 and we saw that the church came together and prayed to be bold in their witness for Jesus. In the midst of persecution, the church came together, and they prayed to be bold in their witness. And that's exactly what happened. right? We saw that the gospel went out to Judea and Samaria. We saw Jews and Gentiles and Ethiopian all hearing the name of Jesus and coming to faith in Jesus and following Jesus. We even know of a man named Saul who was one of the persecutors of the church, one of those going after the church whose life was transformed, and he started speaking boldly the gospel in the synagogues and throughout the area. But when we come to chapter 12, we find that the church is hiding in a home. We find that the church is fearful. They're afraid for their own lives. They're afraid for the lives of the leaders of the church. They're afraid that the church may now disappear or at least become irrelevant. Just a couple of weeks ago, take yourself back to these believers, and here they are in this room. They're hiding. They're scared. They're afraid. Just a couple of weeks ago, thousands of people were coming to faith in Christ simply by people boldly speaking the word, and now we see that they are huddled in a room and fearful that the church is going to become extinct, that the church is going to disappear, that the existence of the church is now threatened. And what we see is King Herod, he's imprisoning and murdering the leaders of the church. We read that James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, he's one half of the sons of thunder. He's one of Jesus' inner circle, was arrested. We see he was put to death with the sword, which means he was beheaded. And then we see the Jewish leaders celebrating his death and encouraging the king to do more, to go after more of the leaders, to continue his assault on the church. And the church feels that they are on the verge of disappearing. Unfortunately, some of us can relate to this story. Some of us right now in our lives can relate to this story more than we ever thought we would ever be able to relate to this. We thought that's something that's in the Old Testament. This is never going to happen. But right now it seems that the church is being attacked from all sides. It's being attacked from politics, it's being attacked from society, it's being attacked from the government. Unfortunately, it's being attacked from people within. People that say that they are Christians, they say that they're a part of the church. But yet we see these people celebrating the disappearance of smaller churches. We see these same people attacking church leaders over partisan matters, not biblical issues. And it sounds like they're more like Herod than Jesus. At the beginning of COVID, it was believed that churches were going to decrease by 20%. Here we are 18 months later, and now what they're saying is that the churches are going to decrease by 30%. People are leaving and not coming back to the church. We see church leaders being attacked. We see church leaders being attacked because they're not experts on disease control. We see church leaders being attacked because they're not sure how to handle the pandemic. 
right? That was not a class that was offered in seminary. We see church leaders being attacked on not being experts on policies. Everything's from tax reform to immigration. And we say, well, if they don't agree with us or if they don't know, we call them heretics, right? We attack their theological foundation and theological truths because they don't agree with us personally. And due to these attacks, listen to this, due to these attacks, the number of pastors retiring and leaving the ministry for secular employment is mind-blowing. It is absolutely mind-blowing. Church staffing experts are expecting the highest number of church turnover in 2022 than in any other year in church history. And here we are. We can relate to the struggle of the church 2,000 years ago. The church today is overwhelmed and it seems vulnerable. It can feel like we're experiencing the end of the church. At least the end of the church as we know it. As we see churches disappearing and many of the ones that remain, they resemble political parties or politics or political people or politicians. Uh, They resemble uh, the, the social agendas for the day more than they resemble Jesus. This is a problem. But listen to this. We can relax. As followers of Jesus, we don't have to have that anxiety. We know that the church remains. We know that the church advances the gospel. And we know that Jesus wins. And let me put wins not in a future presence, but in a present context. Jesus has already won. The victory is already his. Christians from every age have faced conflict and persecution and what feels like unbearable pressure when they are seeking to advance the gospel. It was not, that's not new right now. It's been going on for 2,000 years. John Stott, a theologian, he notes this. He says, throughout church history, the pendulum has swung between expansion and opposition, growth and shrinkage, advance and retreat, although with the assurance that even the power of death and hell will never prevail against Christ's church since it is built securely on the rock. We don't have to worry about the church disappearing. When it feels like Satan has a full court press on the church, that the church is up against the ropes, that they're in the corner of the ring, Satan better hold on. Satan better just hold on. When the church is attacked, churches that advance the gospel they counterpunch with prayer. Churches that are attacked, they counterpunch with prayer. Just like we saw the church respond to persecution in chapter 4 with prayer, we will see in chapter 12 that the church responds to attacks on the church with prayer. Prayer is the church's counterpunch. Just like you guys remember Muhammad Ali when he would be in the ropes and he, you'd see him lean against the ropes. You might see him go into the corner and he was just waiting for the right time. And then he would unleash a mass assault of counterpunches and knock his opponent out. It became known as the rope-a-dope, right? Muhammad Ali had his own strategy, the rope-a-dope. And church, we know that prayer will be the offensive blow that knocks Satan out. Prayer will be the offensive blow that knocks Satan out. Listen, guys, prayer is not passive. It's not a sign of retreat. It's not something we just use as a last-ditch effort. Prayer is a knockout punch, right? It's the act of placing our full confidence, our full trust in the one and only sovereign God that he will hear our prayers and that he will reign supremely forever and ever and ever. Pastor John Piper refers to prayer as our wartime walkie-talkie. That prayer is our wartime walkie-talkie. Church, we're at war. Okay, we, this is not a secret. This is not a surprise. It's not new. We have been at war for 2,000 years. But here's the thing, when we're at war and when the church is attacked, the church prays. And this morning I want to look at a few things that we can learn as a gospel advancing church of today, what we can learn from a gospel advancing church of 2,000 years ago when they were attacked. So go ahead and turn to chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to catch you up real quick. In chapter 11, Peter is sharing the spread of the gospel all the way to Antioch, way up north. And he's confirming to the church in Jerusalem that Gentiles are being saved, that Gentiles are coming to know Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is coming into the lives of Gentiles, right? The Gentiles are becoming part of the body. The church is growing. Yay, church. That's good. That's what we should be doing. This is great news. 
But then we get to chapter 12. We get to verse 1. In verse 1, it says, About this time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was done during the days of unleavened bread. So the days of unleavened bread were seven days after the Passover. It was considered a holy time. It was part of the celebration of the Passover. And when he had seized them, when Herod had seized Peter, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. So when we talk about four squads of soldiers this day, a squad was four soldiers. So here we are, uh, yeah, four soldiers. So here we are, we have uh, 16 guards. Each four are doing an eight-hour shift. Two of them are chained to Peter, and two of them are standing at the door to where Peter is being held. And in eight hours, they switch, and they do it again. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, and delivering him over to four squads of soldiers, he guarded him, intending that after the Passover to bring him out to the people. And so he was going to wait till after that Passover celebration, that seven days. Uh, even, even King Herod had some standards. He wasn't going to kill anybody or murder anybody on a special holiday or a holy holiday. So he's waiting. But listen to this next verse. Look at verse 5. It says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. In about five sentences, we went from celebrating the spread of the church. We went from the church being spread to the entire known world to James being dead, to Peter about to be killed. And what does the church do? They pray. The church comes and they pray. And to those outside the family of God, this is a sign of weakness. They look at the church and say, oh, you don't have anything else to do, so you're just going to pray. They think that the church has given up and that praying is only something that we do as a church when there's no other option. Right? The outside world is telling them, you should be doing something else. Maybe you should be planning a terrorist retaliation. Maybe you should be planning a hostage rescue. Maybe you should be doing something besides sitting in there and praying. But Christians know that prayer is our wartime walkie-talkie. And so when the, church, when the outsiders ask, what does praying accomplish? What are you doing? Why are you so useless? And it's in verse 5 where everything changes. Right? As we continue the story, we'll see that in verse 5, everything changed with prayer. When earnest prayer was made by the church, things changed. When the church invites God to intervene on our behalf, things change. Never, ever, ever underestimate the power of a praying church right churches advancing the gospel they pray earnestly and the greek word here that was translated to earnest it comes originally from a word that means to stretch or to strain right these people they gathered and they were just straining in prayer they were praying with extreme yearning they were going before god probably laying out on the ground and just giving it all to god begging god uh, to intervene to be a part of this Church, when was the last time you prayed like that? When was the last time you just went before God and laid it all out? When you said, God, here's my heart, do whatever, and you prayed not for seconds, not for minutes, but for hours to just seek the will of God, to just praying to God. What stops you from praying like that? Usually what stops us is that we find ourselves not knowing how to pray. Right? We're not sure how to pray. We start questioning what we should be praying for. Or even, do I keep this job or do I get a new job? I'm not sure what God's will is, so we offer up some half-hearted prayer. Do I buy a house? Do I keep renting? Not this house or this house. Do I get married now or do I get married later? Do I get married not at all? Is this the right spouse? Is this not the right spouse? And we just are so confused. And it's hard to pray earnestly when we are so confused. I mean, seriously, think about this. When someone you sick, when somebody you love gets sick, and you start praying for them, and you pray for their healing, are you praying for God's will, or are you praying your own will? Are you praying for God's will? Are you praying your own selfish desire that they would get sick? I mean, I'm being really honest. My mom, she's right here. You could ask her this. 
My mom told me, if I'm about to die and go see Jesus, and you pray for me to get healed, and he listens to you, I'm going to whoop you. <laughs> right? I want to go see Jesus. Right? So now, if my mom gets sick and I have to pray, that kind of makes my prayer kind of weird. Like, heal her, don't heal her, heal her enough, just not enough so she can whoop me, and I just kind of get confused. Like, how do we earnestly throw our heart and pray? So how do we earnestly pray? How do we pray for God's will? How, how do we do that? Right? Especially when Scripture tells us that, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Great. So how am I supposed to pray God's will? I don't know anything. You just told me that we're on two totally different pages. So how am I supposed to pray God's will? Pray scripture. Right? We pray scripture. When we use God's own words by praying scripture, we're aligning ourselves with God's heart. We're aligning ourselves with God. We are praying according to God's will when we pray scripture. Praying the words of Scripture lead us to pray earnestly because, number one, it reveals God's will. Right? When we pray Scripture, it reveals God's will. We will discover the will of God through His revealed word and pray it for the sake of His kingdom. Right? We can pray John 17 and pray that the church be united, as is God's will. We can pray John 13 and pray that the church would love one another, as is God's will. We can pray Matthew 16 and and know with confidence that his church will prevail. We can pray Matthew 28 and pray that his church makes disciples as is his will. That is the great commission that he gave us. And so when we pray Matthew 28, we are praying God's will. Right? So when we open up scripture and we read God's word, it reveals his will to us. The other thing that it does is it gives us confidence that our prayers are aligned with his will. Right? When you pray scripture, you can be confident that it's God's will. You didn't write scripture. Right? This is God's word, and when we're praying what God says, we know that we are in line with God's own heart. Too often we could be selfish. Too often we could be focused on our own desires. Too often we could be focused on our own will that we leave God out of it. But when we pray and read Scripture, we are assured that we are in line with God and praying His will. And the other thing that praying Scripture does, the last thing it does, it keeps us focused on God's will. But my eyes are fixed on you, Sovereign Lord. The Psalms just wrote that. But my eyes are fixed on you. In good times and in bad times, our eyes need to constantly be focused on God and on his will. And we do that by reading scripture. By asking him to take charge and work his will in every situation that arises. And when we read scripture, we know that we are in aligned with his will. Now if this is new to you, if this is something that maybe you haven't done before, let me give you a couple things that you can try. One, you can turn a verse into a first person prayer. If you look at 2 Timothy 1.9, I think we have it up there. You can make that a first person. You can make that about you. And just pray, Lord, you have saved me and you have called me to live a holy life. You did this not because I deserved it, but because it was your plan from uh, the beginning of time. To show my community your grace through Jesus Christ. Thank you, and Jesus, let your glory be known around me. Right, we can pray his word. Or maybe you can pick a verse and declare it as truth. As a church, we raised money for Bibles and we sent them to, to Mindanao, Philippines. And we have a Lido and a Rosemary who are out there uh, working with and, and, and sharing with those people. And we can just take one of God's truths found in Acts 2.1 and say, Lord, your word says that everyone who calls on your name will be saved. I pray that the indigenous people that Lido and Rosemary are working with, they are at a, a place called uh, Mount Matadum, that you would pray for them and that as they call on your name, as a result of having your word in their language, they will be saved. And so we just take Scripture and we pray Scripture. And as we incorporate the word into our prayers, we will pray with greater boldness, we'll pray with greater effectiveness because you will be interceding for God's good perfect, acceptable, pleasing will. Good and acceptable and perfect will. You 
will be praying as you pray Scripture. And it is His will that we should earnestly be praying for, that we should passionately be praying for. And I want you to look at these next verses. Look at what happens when the church prays earnestly. We'll start in verse 6. It says, Now when Herod was about to bring him out, referring to Peter, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly, and the chains fell off his hands. Just picture Peter sleeping and angels like kicking him, trying to wake him up. That was kind of odd. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod, and that all of the Jewish people, and from all the Jewish people, were expecting. This is an incredible story. This is absolutely amazing. This is a miracle. Peter is there sleeping. He is out cold, chained to two guards, with two guards standing at the door in front of him. And he wakes up, and his chains fall off. And he walks out of this jail cell behind an angel, and nobody sees a thing, and nobody knows what's going on. And, and just be clear here, before we start thinking that those were some rena, like some Renacop guards, those were real Roman sentries. Those were real Roman guards. As a matter of fact, we see later in the passage that all of them were put to death because he escaped and nobody knew what happened. Right? This was not something they were taking lightly. They knew what the consequences would be if he left. He's gone. Peter escaped. But church, we've got to focus on this. This is an awesome story. This is incredible. But... This is not about Peter's escape. That is not the main point here. The the main point here is God's grace and God's sovereignty and his deliverance of his people. Rescued. When we read in verse 11 the word rescue, it's the same word that Stephen used when he talked about the rescue of the, the Jews in Exodus, when he talked about them leaving Egypt. It's the same word that Paul used in his letter to the churches in Galatia to describe the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross. In his letter, Paul wrote this, Grace to you and peace from our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver, to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, Jesus is our rescuer. Jesus is our one deliverer. And just like he rescued the Jews from the Egyptians, he sets us free from the shame of our sins. And just like he rescued Peter from the prison, he breaks the chains of our guilt. And just like he rescued the earthly church from the evil age, those who turn to Jesus do not have to fear this age because Jesus makes you victorious. Because you are victorious through Jesus. Through Jesus, Scripture tells us, we are more than conquerors. We are sons and daughters of the victorious King. We are sons and daughters of the winner. We don't have to play the game. It's already been played. Jesus has won, and we are sons and daughters of the king. Because of Jesus, we are right now. We don't have to wait for the second coming. We don't have to wait for some future event. But because of Jesus, we can have eternal life right now. We can be victorious right now. And if you're here with us in this church service or if you're online and you don't have a a personal relationship with Jesus, this is the most important part of this message. This is way more important than anything else that we talk about, is to know that Jesus is the one and only who can rescue you from your sins. He's the one and only who can set you free from the shame and the guilt and the fear that your sins cause. I'm talking about sins, anything that separates you from God. Jesus is the only one that can take that away. He is the only one that can bring you to the Father. He is the only one that can give you eternal life. He's the only one that can give you a life of joy and peace and hope. And here's all you have to do. 
is give them all your stuff. All that junk that is in your life, all that stuff that is holding you back, just confess it. Just tell them. Just give it to them. Just give them the entire bag of all your ugliness. Just give it to Jesus and then accept his grace. Then follow him. Right? Give them your junk, accept his grace, and follow him. This is the gospel, the good news that our sins are forgiven and his righteousness is given. Our sins are forgiven and his righteousness is given. This is the great exchange. Right? Where else can you give somebody all the junkiness in the world and they give you all the best things in your life? Jesus is the only place that that happens. The great exchange. His grace is given not by our works, but by faith alone. Paul mentioned this in Ephesians, but by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. No one ever has, and no one ever will do anything good enough. But God. But God, God sent his son so that none should perish, but that all should have eternal life. There's nothing that we did. And so as you sit there and think, oh, there's something I got to clean up. There's something I got to fix. There's something I got to do. No, you don't. Right? No, nobody sitting in this room that follows Jesus has earned it. The only thing you need to do is repent, to confess your son, sins, turn from your way, and follow Jesus. You can trust him. It is that simple. You can trust Jesus. We should all be asking for his forgiveness and seeking his grace every single moment of our lives. When we understand who we are before the king, we have no other option but to praise his name, seek his forgiveness, and seek his grace. This is what the early church did. If we go to verse 12, it says, when he realized this, and he's talking about Peter, that hey, I was just chained up with two guards and now I'm standing out on the street as free as could be. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So when he got arrested, the church went and started praying. Now he's escaped and he comes and the people are still seeking God's will. The people are still asking for God's grace. See, the gospel uh, in advancing churches, uh, churches that are advancing the gospel, they pray persistently. They pray over and over and over. See, Peter gets arrested, and he goes to the church where they're meeting, and they, not him, but the church prays. Then he is freed, escapes, whatever you want to say. He ends up back at the church, and they are still praying. This is not some five-minute prayer or 30-second prayer tagged on to the end of the meal. These men and women were gathered, and they were earnestly praying for a long time. It could be hours, or it could be days. We're not really sure, but when we read this text, and many of the theologians, when they look at it, they believe it was several days. That somewhere Peter was arrested in the, the Pentecost, the day of the unleavened bread, and then he waited several days, or, or Herod waited several days, and at this whole time the church is praying. And Paul continues to encourage the church to pray. In Ephesians, Paul says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to the To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And that's exactly what this church is doing. Whether it be for hours or day, this church was praying for the church. They're praying for their brothers and sisters. And we think about that. And church, if we're honest, it's really not practical for all of us to gather every minute of every day for weeks on end at somebody's house and just sit there and pray. And to pray nonstop. However, church, it is possible for us to be praying all the time. We can be praying for God's will, and we should be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we should be praying for the church. We should be praying when we get up in the morning. We should be praying when we're walking. We should be praying when we're with our families. Everything that we are doing, we should be praying all the time. We should be praying without ceasing. And sometimes that's difficult, and sometimes we don't know, and sometimes we need little reminders. Good. Make yourself little reminders. And if you need little reminders, just make little reminders. I was just reading a book the other day. Pastor Mike Whitson from Indian Trail, North Carolina. He suggests this. Make a list of four people who you know need to be saved. He calls them pre-Christians. Add to that list four people who were walking with the Lord, but for whatever reason are separated or struggling or not walking with the Lord. He calls them prodigals. Then he says make another list of four people. And these are people that man, maybe God's calling them in the service or you're seeing them and and you say, man, God's going to use that person in in a mighty way. He calls them uh, potentials, right? So he's got pre-Christians, he's got prodigals, and he's got potentials. 
Make a list, 12 names, and pray for them. See, we, we gave you a little bookmarks. We have some on that back underneath those cameras. Grab one of your Bible bookmarks. Well, they'll be online. Write those names in there. Put it in your Bible, and when you read your Bible, pray for these people. Maybe you put that list in a, in a prominent place. Maybe you put the names on stickies. Maybe you put the, the pre-Christians on your bathroom mirror. Maybe you put the prodigals on your, well, if you're me, you put it on the microwave. You see that more than anything else. So you put that there, <laughs> right? And maybe you put your, 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 the, the people that are working the potentials, sorry. Maybe you put the potentials on your nightstand. And before you go to bed, you pray for them. But church, it's not an excuse to say, well, I keep forgetting or I don't know because we can do reminders. Right? There's, there's no excuse not to be praying for our brothers and our sisters. There's no excuse not to be praying all the time. And church, as a gospel advancing church, we need to not only be praying persistently for God's will and for each other, but when we pray, we need to pray trusting to be amazed. When we pray God's will and his plan, God does amazing things. So amazing that in the scripture, the, the, the local church, they couldn't even believe what God did. And if we continue to read in verse 13, it says, And when he, being Peter, knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is an angel. But Peter continued knocking and knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. How would you like to be Peter at that time? Man, these guys are about to kill you, you get escaped, you go to your friend's house, and they don't let you in. That'd be kind of frustrating, right? And this is hilarious. When we step back, and we look at the story. We, we kind of chuckle at this. This is kind of silly. This is kind of funny. We also know that we would never do something that stupid. Right? That would never happen to us as church. Right? That, that's, that's crazy. And we always look at them and we're so quick. Oh, man. Those, oh, them of little faith. Like they don't know what God can do. Let me tell you a little secret. Don't tell any of the pastors. I'm telling you the secret. Uh, there was a group of pastors all over the world. Right? There was a group of pastors that were from um, uh, South Africa from the Netherlands, uh, f- uh, f- from England, uh, from the United States, from Sudan. And we got together and we said, man, there's this place, the New- Nubian region, there's this mountain range, and-, and they were not accepting of the gospel. They had killed or ran out all of the pastors except for one. And so we had a Nubian Bible conference, and we'd been praying about this for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we said, hey, we're going to figure out how to get the gospel in here, how to get the word in here. And we have one pastor. And man, we're going to invite him to this meeting, and we're going to have him tell us what we can do to help him. He doesn't show up. Right? We, the first day we're there, we're like, where is he? Well, we find out. Guess what happened? The local warlord beat him and threw him in jail, and he's not coming. And the local warlord tells him, hey, you keep talking about Jesus. You got about two days to get out of here before we kill you and your family. Long story short, we'll talk about it later. Linda Seeker's not here. She won't tell me to finish the story. Okay, long story short, uh, about two days into the conference, guess who shows up? Our pastor friend. And he comes and reminds you, we are praying to get Bibles to the Nubian region, to this mountain range. We've been praying for not only weeks, but now in person. We've been praying fervently for two days. And a pastor shows up and says, hey guys, um, I, I I was talking with the warlord. He wants me to give him Bibles for him and his leaders, and he wants me to hold Bible studies. I need Bibles. And we look at each other and say, no, this isn't possible. <laughs> like, you, you can't go back. And this guy looked at us and said, what have we been praying for the last couple of weeks? Right? And now God has changed the man's heart that was keeping Bibles out of the area and is inviting me to bring Bibles to him and all of his leaders and the town and for me to teach him what the Bible says. Ah, that's too easy. Right? Like, that, that doesn't work. So we said no because, well, I think we said no because we didn't think of it. Right? We were like, oh, no, 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 that's too hard. That's not what crossed our mind. And too often when we pray, right, when we pray to God, we offer our solutions to God and limit God to those possibilities. We say, God, this is what we think you should do. And so we limit our finite minds to God and say, hey, if you work within these boundaries, we'll accept it. Otherwise, uh, we're not in. Church, this is what we need to know is that the power of earnest and the power of persistent prayer, even if clouded in doubt, 
is still greater than all the power of all the kings and all the governments in the world. Right? If we are just praying to God and we are persistent and we are earnest in our prayers, we're human. There's going to be a little bit of doubt in there. But trust me, it is more powerful than anything else we could pray or ask for, even than we think. Praise God that he is gracious and he honors even the weakest faith. But church, just think about how much more would God do if we would just trust him with our prayers and leave the responses to him? Right, if we just said, God, here's my prayer, here's my heart, I'm praying your scripture, here's your will, amaze me. Let me see what you are going to do. And church, we pray fervently for something to happen. And when God answers that prayer, we're like, oh, that's amazing. What is amazing is our slowness to believe God's ability and his willingness to hear our prayers and answer them. That's more amazing than anything that God will do after everything God has already done. So church, this week you are going to have homework. I'm going to give you homework. I don't normally do this because I know that you're busy reading and studying your Bibles on a daily basis, but I'm going to give you some additional homework. This, this week, I want you to pray for the church. This week, I want you to pray for the church. This week, I want you to pray for your people, your pre-Christians, your prodigals, your, your prospects. I want you to make that list, and I want you to pray for them. Right? This isn't something that you hear me talk about, and then we make a note, or we don't make a note, and we start thinking about what's for lunch. No, this is a serious thing. I want you to pray for your people. Pray for your pre-Christians. Pray for your prodigals. Pray for your, your, your prospects. And then the last thing I want you to do is I want you to pray to be amazed. Seriously, I want you to be amazed. I want you to earnestly pray that God will answer your prayers and that you will be amazed. That he will answer them above anything that you can even think to pray about. Pastor Tori, he once said this. He said, pray for great things. Expect great things. Work for great things. But above all, pray. Just above all, pray. In church this week, I want you to be praying for yourself. I want you to be praying for peace. Right? And we can look in Scripture, John 14, 27. We pray for peace. In 1 Peter 1, we can pray for joy. Some of you, this has been a long 18 months. Right? COVID and, and it has just wrecked our world. Man, just pray for rest. Just ask God for physical and emotional and spiritual rest. Pray Romans 11, 28 and 30. Just pray for rest. And church, if you don't know Jesus, pray for your salvation. And Jesus promised that anybody who calls out to him, anybody who calls out to the name of Jesus will be saved. Pray for that. Confess that. Follow him. If you are not saved, if you do nothing else this week, give your life to Jesus. Church, the, the advancing, the churches that are advancing the gospel, that have been touched by the power and grace of Jesus, we are led to get on the ground and to pray, trusting that God will work beyond anything that we can ask or imagine. Church, this week, I just beg you, pray and be amazed. Dear Heavenly Father, we just... Uh, we are so grateful for the example of this church. And Lord, we would just pray that we would be a church that takes prayer, seri prayer seriously, that we would be a church that is dependent upon prayer, that we would be a church that can't wait every day to seek your face and to seek your glory and to seek your will. God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to pray that we have the ability to talk to the creator, that we have the ability to make request of the Lord of heaven and earth. And Lord, so I'm just gonna take this time and we're just gonna pray a passage to you because you promised this and we know this is your will and we are asking for this. But Lord, you promised that if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then you would hear them from heaven and will forgive them, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Lord, we're, we're asking for that right now. 
Lord, we're asking that we would be healed. We're asking that we would be saved. We're asking that your name would be glorified here in West Hills and Los Angeles and throughout the world that people would proclaim the name of Jesus. Lord, we're asking to be amazed. If we're going to start a revival, why not start it right here in West Hills? Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it's in your son's powerful name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen.